Stanford University. Welcome to the seminar on people, computers, and design. I'm Terry Winograd. Uh, glad to be back, and I want to thank Stephen Dow for having uh, done a huge amount of work the last couple quarters and setting up this quarter uh, and making the seminar work. Um, this is CS 547, and we have a few announcements, it being the first day for people who are taking it for credit. So those of you who are just here to listen, you can take a vacation. Um, that's my microphone. Um, so it's a one-unit course to get credit. All you need to do is attend. Um, and the attendance involves mostly actually being here. Um, and uh, for a couple of times, if you have to miss, you can watch it on video, because there's broad all broadcast on video. So the basic rule is to get credit for coming, get credit for the course. You come to at least eight of the 10 talks in person, sign the sheet, pow, here's the CA, and she'll be passing them around. Uh, and then you're done, you get credit. If you're, uh, and also, sorry, you'll get an email at the end of the quarter, and you can say which ones you watched online. If you need to miss more than two, then you need to send in a note to me and, and get it arranged. Okay, so if you're gonna be here for all but two, that's the end of the issue. So obviously pass, fail, no grade. Um, any other questions about the administrative stuff? If your name's not on the list, go ahead and write your name in if you're planning to take it for credit. Right. They, the list was made from who's been on was on access at the time the list was printed out. So, so if you're not on it, you plan to be. You need to sign up on access, and you need to put your name on the list. Okay, the rest of you are welcome to come anytime. No sign up, nothing, nothing you need to do. Uh, next week we're going to have somebody who has been here a number of times, and you're all I'm sure familiar with, uh, Don Norman, who. Uh, recently retired from Northwestern, but Don never retires. He spends more time on airplanes than anybody I know. So we're lucky to have sort of caught him on a fly through uh, to give a talk about the new book he's written. Today we have Thad Starner from Georgia Tech, who's here for a year on sabbatical at Google. And um, Thad is notable, he did his degree at the Media Lab many years ago, and notable for being presumed basically the primary person in creating the field of wearable computing. If you look in his Wikipedia entry, you will see that it says he has worn his self-designed custom wearable computer continuously, that's the word it has, since 1993. <laughs> so I think that stands as some kind of a record uh, in any case, but in addition to wearing it, uh, he's been doing research over the years on a whole bunch of facets of wearable computing, the input, the output, uh, the use of gesture. Uh, so uh, he really is the, the key go-to person in that area, and he won't tell us what he's doing with it at Google, but I'll bet it's interesting. Bad. So first thing you should, real, uh, you should understand is uh, I don't touch my Wikipedia article. A lot of that stuff is wrong, um, <laughs> just like many things on Wikipedia are wrong. Uh, so take it with a grain of salt. I think one of the things it says is that I can have a conversation and read email at the same time. No, if you do that, you sound like an idiot, <laughs> right? It just, your IQ goes down by a factor of 40 points. Trust me, I know. Um, and uh, uh, I also, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that uh, coming up here. Um, so I've been de-wearing these machines for almost 20 years now. I first started trying to do this about back in 1990. Um, and I've recently become the chair of the Technical Committee on Wearable Information Systems. So uh, IEEE has these, these groups, and one of them is called Wearable Information Systems. Um, so what I'm going to do as part of this talk is give you a quick run-through of sort of wearable computing's greatest hits. Um, because a lot of you guys don't, might not know um, what these folks have been doing in the background that has affected your daily life. Um, so along the way, uh, so I started wearing this as a system to help me be a student. Um, people always ask me, why did you start wearing computers? This is this because is I was paying MIT a lot of money back then. You know, I think it was like $20,000 a year at that point, which is cheap these days. But um, back in the 80s, that was a lot of money. And um, I wasn't getting much from it. I could either pay attention in class, 
get an intuition of what the professor was talking about, and then lose that intuition in the next two hours as I walked out the door. Or I could try to write everything down. And if all of you have done, say, you know, computer vision or something highly mathematical, you spend all your time writing and no time getting the intuition. And so I found that either I could take good notes or pay attention, but not both. So I, so I decided to make a system where I could put the focus on my of my screen at the same level as the blackboard back then. Whiteboards weren't out there yet. Um, I could make a, a keyboard that I could touch type on and also be subtle about it because laptops were uh, outlawed because they were too disturbing in class back then. But people allowed me to use my wearable computer because my keyboard was subtle. Right? It wasn't on the table. I could do it underneath the desk. Um, so I made a system that I could type fast enough that I could take good notes. I took notes in LaTeX. Um, so about as fast as a professor can write you know, integral symbols and you know, my background is pattern recognition and computer vision. Um, as fast as you can do you know, tensor analysis on the blackboard, I can do a book quality formatted notes of that in LaTeX. Um, not anymore, but I used to be able to. Uh, and then I found out that that really was not the use of my, uh, my machine. What, why I really used my machine um, was most of my education was coming from my undergraduate research at the time. Uh, the one-on-one -on -one meetings I was having with professors or with other students. Um, that was had the most important information. Everything from how do I recover my directory from backup? You know, this was with Trevor Darrell at the time. Trevor, how do I recover my, my directory from backup? Oh, that, it's easy. It's tar-xvzf slash dev slash nrst1. True story, by the way. I have it here. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the problem is by the time you try to memorize that and go back to your computer and type it in, you've forgotten it. And I discovered that most of the important things in my life were these face-to-face -face conversations. And so I designed my interface to actually take good notes without interrupting the flow of conversation. And you know, if you talk with me offline, you'll, you'll s if you say something interesting, um, I'll be typing it in. Right? So uh, people who know me kind of know where my boundary is. You know, if, if I'm typing, you said something I want to remember for the future. Got me in trouble once because uh, one of my friends, who's a PhD student at the time with me, uh, said, Thad, I'm talking about my thesis research. This is great stuff. Why aren't you taking notes? <laughs> I said, well, you, you said this, we talked about the same stuff last week. And then she got all irate. So why didn't you stop me? You know, you have this memory aid. Why didn't you stop me? Because I said, well, actually, when researchers talk about their research repeatedly, it evolves, and they learn new ways to say it. And it's interesting, right? So what I've done is I pulled up your file. Yes, I have a file on everybody. I have a file on him. Um, <laughs> and I have our conversation about tenure, which is going to come up here at the end of the talk. Um, and uh, uh, I pulled up her file and sort of started adding to it, adding my new improved knowledge of, of what she was saying. So that's um, uh, the sort of the background of how I got into this. And for some reason, my keyboard has suddenly stopped working. Excuse me for a second here. Then what I've been doing here, at least what I'm trying to do, is show you what I see when I'm giving a talk. So on the screens of the right and left is actually what's in my eyeball. What's on the screen behind me is my presentation. And so whenever there I have a trouble uh, remembering what to say, I'll have transition sentences or little outline notes. And these help me to uh, um, uh, describe or help me to give a better talk. And oftentimes what I find is that when I do this particular setup, and you'll forgive me if I trip over my cords because this is really awkward for me to do. Um, when I do this particular setup, people often ask questions out of the notes as opposed to what I'm saying, which is a little weird for me, but um, it's kind of fun. So we'll see how this goes. So let me tell you a little bit about what, what we've seen in wearable computing. Um, back in 1996, my office mate, Jen Healy, made something called the Effective CD Player. Now, this was an, now the media lab at the time was working on this standard you might know as, as MPEG-1, right, or, MP, or MPEG-2, I think, at that time. And there was one particular version of it you know, uh, 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 call, that's now known as MP3. And we realized we could take an entire CD of music and put it onto one of our computers. And one of our computers was smaller than a Sony Discman. Right? But Jen, being an effective computing person, hooked it up to her galvanic skin response sensors, to our heartbeats. And the idea is that this CD player actually changed the music depending on your mood. We're 
mood was, you know, your heartbeat and this sort of thing. Um, and we actually showed this to one of our sponsors by the name of Sony. Uh, and remember, this is the mid-90s. And they said, and he said, you know, this is going to happen. Somebody's going to make a device. We're going to have an entire library of music on this device. And, you know, it's just going to be the wave of the future for, for music. And Sony should make this. And the response from Sony was, we just bought Columbia Records. Uh, we think if we do that, it will encourage piracy. And they never did it. Um, fortunately, Apple was also a sponsor at that time, but I don't think they got that, this, that idea here. But now what we're seeing is, indeed, what we thought was going to be one of the most compelling uses of these devices is common. Most of you probably have one of these things. Another thing that came out was um, something called 802.15.4. Sorry, sorry, it should not be .4, it should be 802.15. Um, 802.15.1 is actually Bluetooth. And this came from FedEx wanting to do wearable computers in the mid-90s for their couriers. And they said, Thad, they, they talked to me uh, one, uh, one day and said, hey, Thad, we really want to um, um, put these wireless machines on people. And I said, well, the technology is not there yet. Well, why isn't it? Well, there's no sta standard. What standards do you mean? There needs to be a body wireless standard to connect devices to each other. And so FedEx, of all people, started this process of doing an IEEE standard for doing on-body wireless. And that was 82.15. And Ericsson at the time was uh, visiting uh, about a year later. And they had this thing called Bluetooth deep in their research labs. And FedEx and MACOM, these other folks, uh, pushed it forward, got out a little bit early. And uh, it became this, this standard. Now we see it with uh, Bluetooth headsets and most of you have Bluetooth devices on. Um, and so FedEx, um, uh, Dick Braley in particular, um, uh, Gifford, a few other people, really did a, a great job at getting this uh, technology um, out the door. We also had something called, uh, back when there's uh, many of us at MIT, uh, we had uh, something called Zephyr, which was instant messenger that went back and forth. That was kind of fun. And um, a lot of stuff coming out of Carnegie Mellon uh, and a few other places about doing inspection, maintenance, and repair are now very much cons commercial products. Uh, you can see it out of Symbol, now Motorola, Vocalect, people doing inventory picking, maintenance, repair. You don't see these as much. But um, you know, what was great is that those were sort of the golden years for us. Um, a lot of the ideas back there um, really are coming to the fore. One of the things that's hot right now is augmented reality. And um, um, Blair McIntyre and Steve Feiner down at Columbia and, and Tom Caldell out of Boeing and uh, I was up at MIT, we're working on this stuff, and now we're seeing augmented reality on these mobile phones. Now, the problem I see, though, with all this is that um, a lot of the lessons that people, um, I think, could have learned about this have been ignored. And that is that when you make a mobile device, it's all about attention. <coughs> I'd like to show you a little video about that that I think uh, really shows um, shows the issue here. And uh, apparently I don't have a school sc full screen version of this, so I'm just going to do this. Oop, let's start that again. Blackberry from RIM Systems. Text, web, email. Power in the palm of your hand for the professional on the go. And introducing the Blackberry Helmet. Reinforced polymer to protect the skull of the mobile professional on the go. With an antenna for better BlackBerry reception so you can spend more time on your BlackBerry. And a camera that broadcasts a picture of what's in front of you to your BlackBerry so you can always be looking at your BlackBerry. The BlackBerry helmet with optional safety flag. Protect your skull while you destroy your thumb. And what I most love about that video is I didn't have to make it. Right? <laughs> this is from the Canadian Broadcasting Company, a, a thing called the Rick Mercer Report. Um, and you know, the, these devices really are a comedy uh, of themselves. They're, they're a spoof of themselves. People using them really do not pay attention. That's why we have two train wrecks here in California due to, due to texting while training. Right? Um, worst one in 30 years. Uh, was local. Um, the texting driving thing. 
And so a lot of these devices, we can shrink down to being nothing, but the user interface is a big deal, right? There's only so small a display you can make. There's only so small a keyboard you can make. And, you know, what you really want to do is make your wearable computer, and yes, I do count these smartphones as wearable computers, um, to be something that augments your world, does not replace it. Right? Something that helps you engage with people as opposed to uh, block people out. And uh, I encourage you of, as HEI folks to start thinking about these issues because it's something that uh, it really needs, people really need help on. Right? We're just now coming to grips that this is a big issue. Right? There's a lot of work to be done here. Okay, now what I'm here today to talk about though is not uh, the, not this sort of stuff. Um, I'm going to talk about the next generation of cyborgs. Right? These are the things we're seeing at Georgia Tech um, that we're excited about that is not what you normally would think about for wearable computing. Um, in some cases, it's just kind of startling. The first one is something called Mobile Music Touch. Now, this is a glove that actually will teach you how to play a piano melody without you paying attention to it. So let me actually show you a video of that as well, because I think uh, it's better to have a professional talk about it than, uh, than me. Um, let's see if I can do this. Where's my recent media? There we go. All right, in today's Big Eye segment, technology to help you learn to play music just by touch. It's TJ and the Pips here today. <laughs> uh, researchers at Georgia Tech have developed a glove that connects to your cell phone, your MP3 player, or laptop. As the music plays, the tips of the glove vibrate on your fingers to correspond with the fingers you would use to play that song. Yes. Not just about learning to play music, though. It can also help use, be used as a rehabilitation device for people who have lost use of their hands. Technology is going to be highlighted at a future media fest at Georgia Tech here in Atlanta next month. And Thad Warner, I have that right? Storner, yes. uh, associate professor at Georgia Tech. Mm -hmm. uh, I have Chad here because Chad has been practicing with this for the past we hour know it's live. Or, or so. So we'll put it to the test here in a second. But initially, just explain what this is uh, to, to, to lay people, if you will. We're trying to understand. Well, if you're like me, okay. uh, you would really learn, like to learn to play a musical instrument like piano. Okay. But you really don't have the time to do the practice. And it wouldn't be great if you could actually rehearse songs you want to learn without paying attention to them. Okay. And we've discovered this effect called passive haptic learning, uh, where it seems like it's actually possible to do that. So we made this glove, we call it the Mobile Music Touch. And what it is is a wireless device that hooks into your cell phone or laptop. Okay. And so while you're reading email or watching a video or you're doing whatever you normally would do, the, uh, the uh, system plays the song you want to learn. In this case, we're doing Amazing Grace. And as each note is played, uh, vibrators in the uh, fingerless glove vibrate to tap the finger that corresponds to that note on the piano. So what's really amazing about this, in about a half an hour, you'll be able to learn sort of the muscle memory of how to play the Wait song. Wait a minute now. You're telling me all I gotta do is put on a couple gloves and you play a song for me for a half hour, an hour, and I can go put on a, uh, a concert somewhere? Well, I'm not sure about a concert, okay. but you can certainly <laughs> pick it out pretty much easily uh, uh, than you could before. And it seems to work not only just for learning a new song, but also for rehearsal. So, you know, if you're a musician and you have problems with repetitive stress injuries, uh, you can actually have the gloves sort of give you that muscle memory, that feeling of the song, and then you concentrate on the expressiveness. Now, is someone using this for that application yet? You all just developed this. It's not in use. Nobody's using it just yet. Is well, we've done it for, we've done four studies on it, so okay. we really know this effect works uh, pretty well. And as you can see, the, the, the system's relatively small. You can run it off a, a normal cell phone with a Bluetooth connection. So we're not there yet. We're still in the laboratory. But one of the things that we've really got excited about is not just, you know, learning it for uh, having uh, people learn it for playing music, music but also for rehabilitation. So let me introduce yes. Major Tanya Marco here, who's, this is her PhD work, okay. and she's doing some uh, work now on real work. Yes, because a lot of people would love to be able to play uh, instruments, but you're talking about other applications. Yes, sir. Um, what we're looking at is using it as a form of hand rehabilitation. So we're currently working with people who are designated as quadriplegics, which means due to a break in the neck, hmm. they've lost the ability to use, some ability to use the four limbs. Uh, what we've done is work with a few folks and they've tried the glove. One thing that's really neat about it is they get to play the piano, which is actually a form of rehab in and of itself because you're doing some fine dexterous movements with the hand. But we've had some interesting comments about the vibration that it uh, tended to kind of remind them of where their fingers were because wow. many of these people have lost the ability to sense with their hands. 
So if they touch an object, they don't get that feedback of actually touching something. So we're trying to improve their ability to uh, perceive with their hands and also their ability to use their hands, those fine motor skills. Okay, wow, that is amazing, uh, an application there. Uh, I'm certainly amazed as well that you could put a glove on and 30 minutes later <laughs> be able to play the song. Chad has had this glove on for how long now? <laughs> About 45 minutes. About 45 minutes. What was the song? Well, here, this is what the song would have sounded like. Okay. <laughs> That's that, before. That, 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 that is my musical repertoire. Okay. okay. That's how good I can do it. So, he's had the glove on. For right, 45 this is minutes. And what was the song, by the way? It's It's Oh, this ought to be good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chad. Both of us are nervous. Okay. This thing buzzed. <laughs> and, it, and all I did, all I did was I played on my mouse. Okay. I did my little you hurricane stuff. You did my hurricane stuff, and it was buzzing on my fingers. You were working. I us see if I can do it. Oh, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Now, do you have any talent, a background in music, ever played the piano? And you That's didn't it. know that song, Never. correct? No, I, no. I've heard it. But I wouldn't, wouldn't know what fingers to use. Now, there's a reason we're using Beethoven's Third Degree. I was hoping for like this liberation <laughs> song we have. Well, that is repertoire. clearly proof that it, this is Because we're doing it on live middle, TV, middle, everything up, goes down, wrong. Down, 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 down. Okay, you guys are going to eliminate the need for piano teachers. I don't think so. There's still a lot of You find out very quickly with the first piece. Subtleties. Subtleties to express this and stuff, you really got to practice with the teacher. But at least this gets you over the hurdle of the need. And what's great with the the happens? Oh, wrong keyboard, right. Sorry, I forgot. You're not just I got two machines here. The interesting thing with this is that uh, the, uh, you can imagine that this glove would be better for woodwinds or something where you're not moving your hands up and down, but everybody has relative pitch, right? So as, soon as, you, as long as you start on the right note, you know that higher notes are to the right. And so in our, pra in, in our experiments, we have people doing amazing grace and dashing through the snow and that sort of stuff, and people just seem to be able to do this. I'm not quite sure why. I think it's just because they kind of know which finger is next, and they even do the crossings. Um, like they know they're supposed to use the pinky, but that doesn't quite sound right, so they keep moving. Correct. Over. Okay. Um, and again, Beethoven's Ode to Joy is nice because for this, there's no movement. Doing, I was too nervous to do Amazing Grace because Amazing Grace is actually a relatively complicated movement, um, and so I didn't want to do that. But um, you know, this guy's sitting there tracking his hurricane in the CNN you know weather desk, and having this thing tapping his hand. And uh, uh, it worked. And the thing is, this thing works, I mean, not, uh, we've done now five studies on this. And I keep on pushing the wrong keyboard. Uh, excuse me. Um, I keep on doing something on this keyboard, expecting that to change. Um, the, uh, here's, here's also something we had in Kai 2010. Uh, sorry, this is kind of a little hard to see. But this is uh, something where you have people um, um, train up. Once, so you, so you have them train up to where they can run through the whole thing once. Then for 30 minutes, they go and do a GRE, basically a, a grad school type reading comprehension test. And um, for, um, for the ones, uh, uh, and ones of them, some of them are just hearing the music over and over again. Some of them are hearing the music and feeling the, the fingers being tapped. And um, uh, the ones where there is, um, uh, no tapping. Their errors are really huge. That's the, that's the red bars. The ones with the green bars are the ones who had tapping. So this thing really does do reinforcement. You know, this is a passive haptic rehearsal. It really does seem to have this big effect. Um, and not only is it just rehearsal, it's just learning too. You can actually give somebody a brand new song and they will pick it up like this uh, um, uh, Beethoven's Over Joy. And matter of fact, while I was giving the Kai talk presenting this work, um, I was, it was the first time I used the system. I haven't played piano in like 25 years. So my student put this thing on me, and while I'm giving the Kai talk, it's a 20-minute talk, um, Beethoven's Ode to Joy was playing on my hand and in my ear, which actually is kind of a hard thing to do to give a talk and hear <laughs> this sequence over and over again. But you can do it. Uh, if any of you were in the audience, you could tell me how good the talk was. But, <laughs> um, but at the end of the talk, I went over and said, OK, now we're going to try this for real. You know, uh, this, I've actually been my own. It's the first time I'm actually doing this. Um, I walk over to the, to the piano, and it's like my hand is possessed. It's this really weird feeling of getting the muscle memory, um, but nothing else. Right? The muscle memory is there. Right? But, uh, fortunately, I have a little bit of musical training, so I know what the notes 
you know, the, the length of the note should be. Um, so it worked pretty well. And, and it, it, uh, if you have, it, it's an experience. You really have to try this to believe it. It's really quite weird. Yeah? Don't know. Good question. Like to find out. Want to do an experiment? <laughs> uh, here's an interesting thing. Uh, brand new out of the research labs. Didn't realize this uh, was the case until oh, a couple days ago. Um, turns out that vibration alone works better than vibration and audio. Why? <laughs> right? Audio, nothing, of course, doesn't work. Audio doesn't work. Audio and vibration works. We get these effects, but vibration is better. I don't know why. It's interesting. Another thing that uh, we uh, have done with this is uh, looked at different types of things that it might um, uh, uh, extinguish the effect. So for example, um, does this work when there's too much mechanical noise in the system, right? If you're doing a scavenger hunt, right, you can imagine that you couldn't feel the vibrations very well. There's too much other motion going on. Turns out that's okay. What happens if I interfere with your short-term memory? What if I have you playing a memory game? Still works. What happens if I have you doing reading exams? Still works. What happens if I have you watching a film, you know, audio video type thing? Still works. Um, <coughs> drinking is an interesting question. <laughs> Haven't tried that one yet. I'll volunteer for that experiment, yeah. Um, so, uh, and, but the interesting thing, so we found no real significant difference in these different conditions. But for each individual, it seems that some individuals ha are more sensitive to some interference than others. And we don't know why. And that's also a relatively new effect. Um, yeah? So this reminds me of something, it's, it's quite different, but, but related. So many years ago, we were teaching people about um, a text editor that had a keypad. And they went through a number of sessions over a number of days where they had to use the keypad. And at the end, we asked them if verbally if they knew where their fingers would go to do these things. And they said no. Mm -hmm. And then we'd say, just do it, like show me the such and such command. And their fingers did it. Yep. So they did and so they were unaware that they had learned all of this, that their that their hands knew what they would say things like my hand knows what to do. I don't know what to do, but my hand does. Do you get that same kind of thing where people are not how good are people at articulating what they're doing as opposed to just doing Well, we're HCI folks, right? We know people are really horrible articulating what they're doing. That's why we do very controlled experiments. Um, even when you know you're horrible articulating what you're doing, people are still bad at it. So, um, yeah, it's, it, doing these experiments well is a pain. Um, but one of, the things that, you know, one of the great things about being an academic is I get to tell everybody everything. So uh, we were showing off this original, uh, the original stuff to uh, people at the Shepherd Center, uh, which is a spinal cord center in, in uh, 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 Atlanta. And these are the, are the people that, you know, you're some hot, young, 25-year-old guy with your new ninja motorcycle, and you're using 285 as your personal racing track at 2 a.m. And you, you know, slam to a curve a curb, and you uh, are, are, are a quadriplegic. This is where you go for the best care, almost in the country, I would, I would argue. And um, uh, you're depressed, right? It takes a month for the swelling to go down for e even to realize how bad your situation is. A month. And in that time, these uh, rehabilitation people are telling you to do things like this, right? Try to keep your nerves from atrophying. Because if you don't use your hands or your feet, your nerves will actually atrophy. And so, um, uh, one of the big problems is getting people to actually do their rehabilitation exercises. And we had this weird effect with our subjects where they said, you know, after, you know, when I first started using the mobile music touch, um, I couldn't really tell the difference between these two fingers. But afterwards, I could really distinguish the fingers. And, you know, the Shepherd Center <coughs> people heard this and said, well, that's real interesting. Um, and so we started running a pilot study on whether or not this might help for um, rehabilitation. Now, this is, this is a, a study that's going on right now. We're doing the second pilot. Um, and we're looking for people who are uh, quadriplegics with a, due to sp partial spinal cord injury. And, and quadriplegia just means that all four limbs are affected. It doesn't mean you can't move. It just means all four limbs are affected. And a lot of times, these guys have clawed hands, 
right? <coughs> Stuff looks like this. And they still might be able to, you know, to, to use a mouse or to, to, to feed, or feed themselves, that sort of thing, but it's really kind of obnoxious. Um, and uh, we put these gloves on these folks, and uh, after, and this was active practice, and we're currently doing passive practice, um, and we're just having them practice playing piano. What's cool about this is, is because of these gloves, you learn to play songs much faster than you would if you just sat there playing a piano. Right? It's like you got this superhero style you know, learning ability suddenly. Um, and so it's really encouraging because your rehab is not um, you know, just this exercise that's trying to get you back where you were. Your rehabilitation is actually learning a new skill, learning how to play piano. One of our subjects actually um, learned to play happy birthday for his grandson, and that was very emotionally latent thing for him. And one of our other folks who had been helping us with this project um, was describing to us why this was so important to him. You know, tears came to his eyes as he said, you know, you think your life is over. And here, you've given me a new outlet to actually learn something new while I'm doing my rehab. And that just changed, can change everything for them. And um, one day we uh, actually came in for our most recent subject, and like I said, this is ongoing. We don't know how much an effect there is. But what we'll be seeing in our pilot subjects is that their ability to, after using this for about a month, their ability to grab and release objects is improved. There's actually a study called the, the ARAT um, for grasp and release. There's also a study that looks at the just noticeable dif difference in points that you can feel on your fingers. And these guys are actually getting statistically significant improvement in that as well. And they're also having improvements in activities of daily living. Matter of fact, our most recent subject came in and said, hey guys, look what I can do. <laughs> and we're like, thank you very much uh, for sharing that. Oh, that's interesting, right? Because this guy had clawed hands. He could never, you know, he wants to flip off his physical therapist. If any of you have ever been in physical therapy, <laughs> it's a very good release. Um, but the best he could do was this, right? Being able to strain his finger was a big deal for him. So now one of our activities of daily living that we uh, are, are looking to test is flipping somebody off. <laughs> the other thing is buttoning their own buttons. Right? That's a big deal. Um, and so uh, we're actually continuing to do, do work with this. Tanya is the one who's uh, pushing it. If you've got more questions about that, um, you can just ask her about it. Uh, yeah? Um, do you know if this will, uh, probably will hold true if it isn't vibration, say if you use temperature changes instead? And um, to how is it, is it localized just to the tips of the fingers, or can you distribute those vibrations to other parts? Well, of the what we're doing is we're using vibrators uh, tuned to 160 hertz, which is exactly the frequency that you're most sensitive to in your pachinian corpuscles, which are along here and along here. Our vibrators are back here. Because they're so powerful, they vibrate the entire finger, and you get, and you get uh, sensitivity everywhere. It also means we can make a glove that you can wear in your daily life without interrupting your daily life. Right? So we actually ha are sending our subjects home with these gloves so that they look like biker gloves, right? which they wear, wear anyways for, their, for the ones in manual chairs. Right? Um, so uh, 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 it turns out you can actually make a glove that doesn't interfere. still gives you the effect. And we just stumbled upon it. You know, we, we, we have a mechanism now. We think we know what's going on. Uh, but it's kind of hard to prove it without you know, doing a little bit more physiology research. OK. So uh, I have until 50 till, or do I have till two? OK. Um, so let me talk, let me change tracks here for a second and talk about uh, what I typically get when I do a wearable computing talk. Um, when I was talking about wearable computing interfaces, people always said, you know, I, I don't like this keyboard you're showing me. I don't, I, I don't, like, I don't like these displays. You know, uh, for a while I get, I'll, I'll, um, I'll use a wearable computer when I can talk to it. Right? And then people realize speech recognition is kind of, well, socially inappropriate many times, right? In a conversation, in a lecture like this, if you're all taking notes by talking to your computer, it'd be a cacophony, right? Um, so then people were starting to say, hey, I'll use a wearable computer when it can read my mind. Well, so what I've learned over the years is take people's suggestions literally and see what we can do. So our goal is to recognize phrases of natural language directly from brain signals. Um, there's a lot of reasons to do this. Currently, uh, uh, interfaces, mobile interfaces look like this. Um, there's an EEG on the left-hand side. It's called an FNIR, functional near-infrared uh, interface on the right. Uh, oftentimes, these, computer, these brain computer interfaces are quite slow. We're talking about a bit every two seconds with 80% precision. That's sort of typical. 
the world's a record using something called SSVEP, which is about a bit every second. Okay, so that's really quite slow. Um, if we could actually somehow get entire phrases of language out of your brain, we're hoping that can speed up these, these, inter these interfaces considerably. Now, how can we do that? Well, the, uh, um, I love starting this off because everybody who knows neuroscience looks at me like I'm on cocaine when I talk about this. Um, and so let me see if I can convince you. So if I think of the word apple, right, and I actually look at the brain activation energy, there's a bit of it that's lit, lit over here that talks about sweet. Another one op opens up uh, that, that uh, activates on red. Another one that activates on fruit. And another piece, you know, somewhere random that, well, in this crowd, activates on computer, right? And it's sort of all over the place. It's all throughout the brain, it's kind of hard to map. Though there are people working at this, on this at CMU. But when I say the word apple, right, there's a little part of my motor cortex, right about there, that's controlling my lips and my larynx and my tongue. And if I could scan that in fine enough detail, <coughs> right, I might be able to get out my phonemes. My problem is this something called a bold response. It takes about 12 seconds for each of these things to refresh. So our problem is our scanners aren't good enough. Right? If I could somehow get that little section of the brain, I'd have a chance. But I can't. Um, however, with sign language, it's much, much bigger hand motion. And you can measure that. Because right? it involves uh, the, this is somatosensory here, it's better cortex here. It involves the hands, the uh, shoulders, it involves some of the head. There's a lot of sign language that's in here. And not only is it just uh, on one side, like your right hand is controlled by the left side of your brain, but it's also on the other side as well, especially when you have things like, say, hot versus cold, one-handed versus two-handed signs. So we decided to see if there's anything here. Right? Can, is there any chance at all of doing this? And so we have our own personal fMRI. I love this. Um, actually, Georgia Tech uh, at uh, University of Georgia went together and got a, a research-grade fMRI uh, for non-medical uses. And so this is a, a very nice resource we have. And uh, we, start doing, um, uh, we started looking at doing sign language, both real and imagined. Now, there's actually a real reason to do this. This is not just me playing around. I work with a professor by the name of Melody Moore Jackson who works with ALS patients. These are, this is Lou Gehrig's disease. It's a progressive paralyzation of your body. Right? It might start with your left leg. It might start with your voice box. Right? It's kind of random. And, but over time, you become more and more withdrawn in your own body, so you can't move at all. Now, most of you know this guy up here. This is uh, Stephen Hawking. He's the longest living ALS uh, 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 patient we know of. Um, he's lived with the disease quite a long time. And he's still able to control um, uh, basically a, uh, an eyebrow switch. And that's how he does his writing, um, if I remember right. Um, so the people we work with actually have no control, right? No eye movement, no eyebrow raise, uh, none of this stuff. Um, so uh, the folks we work with are really, uh, really locked in. Um, now, I should say right, right away that this is not we haven't done any ALS patients on this yet. The patients currently are me. I can show you a video of me in the tube doing this. Um, but the idea we wanted to show is that, hey, you know, maybe we can just, maybe we can do a set of vocabulary. Maybe we can do bed versus chair. And that's what the first two things are. You can imagine talking to somebody and saying, do you want to go to your bed or do you want to go to your chair? And then they try to sign, right? You teach them to the sign as they're losing their ability to move. And then when they actually do lose their ability, you have a trained model. You can actually try to pick this up in their head. So do you want to go to your bed or to your chair? They try to imagine doing this or try to do it. Turns out that people who have ALS, when they try to, when they try to move, it's more, actually more like us actually moving than us thinking about moving. Um, so also we're looking at things like hot versus cold, pain versus OK. So you can see that I'm, I'm cheating here, right? I'm looking at two-handed versus one-handed signs. And uh, indeed, that's what we're getting here. You can see that uh, left, left hand side is bed versus rest, middle is chair versus rest, and uh, right hand side is chair minus bed. In other words, if you want to go to the chair or bed, just look to see if that part in the right cortex lights up. And uh, we can also do it when you imagine doing things like hot versus cold. This is our best one right now. Um, it shows you the difference between the two. It's much more messy. 
uh, but you can still pick it up. And here's our current results between real sign and imagined sign. Uh, we're getting very, very good results here, like 97% accuracy on forced choice, hot versus cold, etc. Imagined sign's a little worse. Trying to choose one of seven is not great. It's 51%, but still better than expected. Um, and so now we're trying to use all our machine learning tricks to uh, try to go further with this. Now, one great thing about doing phrases that you teach people to say is that you can design the phrases to be very distinct. Right? Now, as a matter of fact, I should probably not be trying to do natural language. Right? I should probably not be trying to do sign language. I should probably be doing some made-up language where it's wiggle your left toe and move your right thumb. Right? But the sign language is kind of the, you know, really cool thing. If we could do that sign language, it'd be excellent. So that's what we're doing first. But the thing we're looking at right now is can I do entire phrases? Can I do things like, the bed is hot, I'm in pain? And this is hopefully what this, the, the, the uh, data would look like. Excuse me, I just lost my brain. Let me plug it back in. There we go. Um, and uh, this, is, this is actually real data. I don't know if you can see this. This is my brain um, with my locations, I believe. And this is how it's, supposed to, it's starting to look, li look like. And the thing is, for eight sign phrases, sorry, eight phrases of sign, we're getting about 40% accuracy. Um, so this is ongoing research. Um, if people are interested in this, please talk to me because um, uh, I'd like to see it go further. Okay. Now, where am I going with this? Well, uh, when I do these interfaces, they're almost always for me eventually. Um, and so I really want to make a wearable version of this. I want to be able here and, and you know, stare at you and be able to control my computer. Right? So if I just said something, for example, um, uh, um, let me send you that that paper, right? And the computer say knows what paper I'm talking about, and it puts a confirm signal. I'd really like to be able to wiggle my big toe, have my little brain sensor here realize that I'm wiggling my big toe and trigger the okay. Um, is this useful? I don't know, right? Um, but it's certainly interesting. Um, and for those of you who are talking to me earlier, that's one of the reasons we made the magic system is to actually distinguish this motor movement in my cortex from my everyday movement. Um, so uh, the uh, idea is eventually, maybe we can actually make a mobile wearable system uh, for brain interfaces and see whether or not this is useful in everybody, people's everyday lives. Okay. So any questions about that before I get even stranger on you? Yeah. What is the prospect for an fMRI apparatus that you can carry on your head? Um, no. <laughs> However, that's why we have these amazingly slow things. Um, this thing. This is my best bet. The F near is just infrared um, light. It goes, believe it or not, your skull is relatively clear to it. Um, it bounces off your brain tissue. If your brain tissue is perfused with blood, it backscatters differently than if it's not. If it's perfused with blood, your brain's been used recently for that particular area. So the idea is that perhaps we can actually make one of these things. These things are, are relatively tolerant to motion artifacts compared to EEGs. Um, so maybe we can actually make something that once we know where to hit, um, maybe we can make a, a, a mobile system that is relatively tolerant of everyday motion. Um, that's the goal. As a matter of fact, I brought one of these here. If you want to play with it. This is a single channel one um, that I have on loan to play with. Uh, and you can see that this is, this is really just a set of infrared LEDs and, and uh, receivers. Unfortunately, it goes to this big honking box, which we got to do something about someday. But yeah, you know, it's still small enough to fit in my bag. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, when you said the current PCI fastest rate was one bit per, per second, do you mean for FNIR or no? That's for <coughs> SCP. <coughs> okay, that's where you have. Let's see if I get this right. If I put an LED flashing at 15 hertz and an LED flashing at 13 hertz in your visual field, um, you don't have to move your eyeballs. All you got to do is pay attention to one or the other. It will actually change an alpha wave in the back of your head. And so and it's a relatively fast signal. Um, so what you do is, um, you know, I can have a yes or no, bi yes or no binary tree. 
and I just pay attention to one or the other flashing LED. And that's it. That's SSVEP. Any other questions? Okay. So now I was going to say about uh, something that I was talking to Terry about when I was coming up for tenure. Um, this is why I'm really doing wearable computing. Uh, I believe uh, that we have a chance to do the grand AI experiment with this stuff. Um, so let me, what's, what does grand AI mean? Well, there's occasionally been experiments in artificial intelligence where somebody just bets it all and tries to make a big system that really tries to solve some problem. Um, Doug Lanott and MCC tried to do uh, something called Psych, which was trying to encode background knowledge using basically a rule-based system. And I think Psych was about 85 megabytes at one point, and could do some, it could do some ra reasoning on things in the real world. Uh, it only got so far, though. Rod Brooks, uh, who was the uh, um, chair of the AI lab, uh, said, well, a lot of our intelligence is embodied in the environment around us, right? If we were a squid, doorknobs would not make sense to us. Neither would these stairs. So a lot of our intelligence is actually embodied in the physical apparatus around us. Um, so I'm going to make this robot called COG and actually make a system that I can teach to work in the human's world. I'm going to put eyes where it's, uh, humans' eyes are. I'm going to put ears where our ears are. I'm going to put uh, end effectors that look like ours. I'm actually going to try to some, do something where I can train up COG to do human-level things right, in this embodiment approach. My problem is uh, COG is chained to a, is, is bolted onto a desk. He's big. Nobody's going to train it like a baby. Right? It's not going to get that much data. And, you know, again, there's there a, there a certain amount of... Uh, uh, work that has come out of this that really is quite good. But I think there's only so far you can take the approach. With my apparatus, I can put eye eyes, I can put cameras really where my eyes are. I can put microphones really where my ears are. I can put sensors that, uh, that uh, sense my wrist motion, my hand motion, using wristwatches. Then it's not that inconvenient anymore to do this. I can put a camera in my cap that actually looks to see what I'm doing. And now, I don't actually have to do the hard object recognition task, right? I don't have to recognize every can of soda out there or everything I could drink. All I got to do is recognize that my hand, when I do this, it's a drinking motion, right? When I do this, it's a book, right? When I do this, it's a handshake. The problem is if I made recognizes for each and every situation like that, I could do that until I die and not get that far. So what we really need is something that monitors my life as I live it and really uh, looks for patterns in it. And then over time it says, hey, I see that you do this every morning at 9 a.m., right? This action. And it shows me a little video clip of it. And here's the last 30 times you did it. What is that called? I could say that's drinking. or if it says, I see you do this and this every morning at 9 a.m., these two actions together, what's that? Well, that's eating breakfast. I do see you do this. Right? So now I'm going from individual things to this grammar of everyday life. What's this chain of things called? That's driving to work. So that's, believe it or not, <laughs> what I've been working on. Um, how far can we go with this idea? Can we actually automatically discover a language of everyday behavior and then have a computer <coughs> actually understand and reason on it? Make a machine that understands whenever I shake somebody's hand, I should pull up the face recognizer in my Rolodex. Right? Um, every time when I see me taking a drink, it may be a good time to show me my most recent emails. Can I, make an, uh, can I make an agent that actually uses that information such that I want to wear all this apparatus all the time to give it better, uh, better cues? So this is where, where we've gone with that so far. This is the cleanest system we have. It's, uh, uh, it's exercise data. Now, what this is, I, I should also mention why Terry gets into this, is that I gave this spiel uh, to him saying, you know, he asked me you know, why I'm doing AI. 
And, um, and I explained this to him. He said, well, why don't you use that for your tenure packet? It's like, well, because I'm afraid people think I'm a fruitcake. Right? And Terry sat there for a minute and said, yeah, do it after tenure. So it's after tenure. <laughs> and so you guys are getting the first uh, video recorded version of what I'm actually trying to do with wearable computers. This is the long-term plan. So here's some of the first results of this, first, first really compelling results. This is uh, one of my students actually wearing uh, uh, inertial sensors. Now this is an accelerometer and gyroscope uh, mounted on his wrist while he's doing his exercise routine. And it's, it's, you know, he just uses dumbbells, so it's like, you know, curls and rows, and I can't remember what all else. And it just, and he just gets this stream of 60 uh, data, actually I think it's 70 data, um, from it. And it looks something like this. Right? And his system takes this data in and automatically discovers that he's doing, say, six actions of this sort in a row, followed by six actions of this sort in a row followed by, I can't remember what else is in here. But basically, it is automatically discovering from the data, it doesn't care what the data is, it's just automatically discovering from this data that there are six classes of stuff here, and then it labels it. And it's hard to say, there's no real good metrics to say how good this is working, but if you use it from a pattern recognition standpoint, it's getting 97% accuracy. It's recognizing all six exercises, it's not recognizing any additional motifs, we should call these repeated time series signals. 97% accuracy, which is pretty, pretty good. Now, you could have made a gesture recognizer that does just as well as this, right? I have no doubt. But the thing is, this is something that it learned how to make the gesture recognizer itself from just a continuous stream of data. So we've done this with um, a few other things. We've done this with OCR, just feeding in, you know, scans of books. Uh, we uh, did it for medical data. We've done it for, um, uh, uh, you know, MIT's open courseware thing. We just recorded some economics uh, lectures, and we discovered this eco economist's favorite phrase, right? So, you know, I don't know, Freakonomics or something. I can't remember what the phrase was. But, you know, we discovered, you know, that's his favorite phrase. It's a key phrase. He uses it throughout his lecture. Also, United States and, you know, gross domestic product and, you know, these sorts of things. What we also discovered are things like coughing. This particular professor had a particular throat clean, <coughs> right? And discovered that as a class. Is that interesting? Maybe. Maybe this guy has a, a, a respiratory disease. Maybe I can actually use that to monitor his health and how his treatments are working. Huh. We also discovered, you know, noises with the, when you, I guess the microphone's not on, uh, when you tap the microphone by mistake. Uh, it recognizes that class. And one of the other things we did, which is kind of compelling, is we uh, took some old data of mine from MIT. Something I did for my master's thesis, though this is Josh Weaver wearing, uh, wearing the camera hat. This is a camera that looks down at your hands and tracks sign language. Right? So it had a uh, 40-word vocabulary and five-word phrases. I think the things are like, uh, actually I actually have a video of this now I think about it. Let me pull it up. Um, Uh, PLC, uh. So this is what the data looks like. I want the brown table. The idea was to make a real-time sign language to English translator. Um, turns out it's not such a good idea. You like the gray bicycle. There's better ways to do it. Um, but let me get to the end here. So what the data looks like is this. Oh, this is kind of interesting from a computer vision standpoint. This is the view from the camera. Notice this big fleshy thing we that says nose. Gray it's great for color calibration, right? Because now you know what the hand should look like. You like the yellow box. Let me show you what the system's getting. It's getting the bounding ellipse of these hands, and that's it. I want the XY the position, dot XY, angle of the bounding ellipse, size of the bounding ellipse, that's it. Right? Um, and you can see the noise you in the like data. The gray Remember, this, is, this is 1998 on an SGI Indy. Give you some sort of idea. So this was the brown clearly phone. data not gathered for this, um, this purpose, which is part of the point. And it automatically discovered 23 of those 40 signs. So we actually feel that we have a chance here. We're going to try to actually start putting 
if next time you see me with something attached to my head and something attached to my wrists, right, you know what's going on. Um, I'm, I'm getting weirder on you. Um, but I, uh, I'm actually trying to get lots of data. Um, now that leads me to something else. So this is my last crazy project uh, coming out of the wearable computing crowd. It's called CHAT, Recitation, Hearing, Augmentation, and Telemetry. You have to go with good acronyms. This is uh, work done by the Weld Dolphin Project down in Florida. Uh, Dr. Denise Herzing is working with me on this. Uh, she works with Atlantic Spy Dolphins. And this is an experiment they did back in 1998. Um, so the idea is that uh, uh, we're going to try to communicate with these dolphins uh, by having them mimic stuff that we can handle. Problems with dolphins is they're at 200, they, they, they basically talk up to 200 uh, kilohertz, way high up in the frick spectral ra range. It's very hard for us to gather that data. The other problem is that these <coughs> dolphins actually do constructive interference. So they can actually send you a message without you hearing it. That's really funky. Um, and that's part of the whole echolocation. They have three modes of, uh, of sound. One is echolocation. One is what's called uh, signature whistles. Uh, dolphins have sort of names. And so they can actually call each other by the name. Um, they, uh, there's also this thing called burst pulse mode. Um, and they got two independent vocal tracks that they can use simultaneously. And they can use for two, for two di different independent things at the same time. <coughs> really funky, really hard. But uh, what Denise was doing here is, is uh, the, the, the uh, dolphins, the wild dolphins, like uh, four things she discovered. They like to drag around scarfs in the water. They like to drag on rope. Uh, they like to drag along some of the seaweed, and they love riding bow waves. Dolphins like to surf, basically. And uh, she was trying to do stuff that would uh, naturally elicit this behavior so that um, uh, um, they could actually, what she's doing is she's uh, um, passing a scarf back and forth between researchers and calling for it by making these human audible sounds. And uh, uh, if I remember right, one, uh, one day they were, were doing this, and they dropped the rope and just made the sound, and one of the wild dolphins came up and gave it back to them. Um, here what they're trying to do is get the dolphins, they have this, this, this keyboard basically, they're trying to get the dolphins to you know, select things they want. The problem is that uh, the wild dolphins won't actually go touch things. They'll just kind of orient to the object, which is difficult to detect. Um, and it's also, they have no way to actually record and do pattern recognition on the audio uh, in real time. So while they tried to do this, their wearable computer was not sufficient. Their underwater technology was not good enough. So we're trying to help them out. In particular, we're trying to make a, a waterproof keyboard where there's a magnetic uh, thing in your glove and hall effect sensors in your wrist. You can select which, which sound you want to listen and then push go. Um, you can see some of the sketches here. We also are working on a mask where there are, this is Denise actually checking out the mask a couple days ago. Uh, the idea is that we have lights in them, LEDs, and all this has to be waterproof, of course, which tells you from which direction uh, uh, you got a certain signal. So if a one dolphin goes, wheat, wheat, and you're surrounded by five, which one asked for it? Right? So you need to know which direction to look. And uh, so we're doing iterations of that with her. Um, these are the current four uh, sounds we're trying to recognize. We just made some rec uh, recognition software for it. Trying to do a directional hydrophone. That's the sketch there. Making that waterproof is a real pain. Um, so Seawater is not your friend. Uh, and, um, uh, but what we're really trying to do, so we're trying to do this initial thing. We're getting used to making underwater wearable computers. But remember what I said about recognizing sign language during pattern discovery? What we're really trying to do is take the audio the dolphins use in their everyday communication, uncover the fundamental units they're using, and also discover the grammar they're using. We know that they have tags for objects. We know they have tags for each other. We know that, say, a male dolphin will take part of its mother's signature whistle. Um, can we actually, instead of trying to have the dolphins mimic the audio that we're producing for these things, can we actually start hearing the fundamental units using a heads-up display um, seeing sort of the, 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 that it's, it's uh, unit one followed by unit three followed by unit four, like say a songbird, and then mimic it back to it or play with it, right? So we send back four, three, one or something like that. 
when you discover these units that they're using, play it back, interact with them, uh, uh, sort of using their own vocalizations. And uh, that's, our long, that's our current really hard pattern discovery problem. We're working on this. Uh, we'll see how far we get. But with that, let me thank my funders. As lots of them, and all, of course, as all the grad students know, the professors don't do any of the real work. It's all the grad students. So I'll thank my grad students and my collaborators uh, who've been so helpful in doing this, and some of my industrial partners um, who uh, uh, sometimes wish to remain nameless when I say my more funky talks. So uh, we have a little bit of time for questions, and I'll thank you very much. Come on, I, 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 I was going to say, I, I said stuff that's got to irritate somebody. <laughs> yeah, are we going to be able to talk to dolphins? Um, <laughs> <we're>, <laughs> it's kind of, so we know that we see a lot of interesting dolphin behaviors and a lot of interesting dolphin vocalizations. Um, we believe there's grammar to it, like there's grammar to bird song. Um, the question is, how perplex is it? How much perplexity is in that signal? Um, what do these signals mean, right? And nobody's had the ability to live in their world yet and collect this data. So, um, uh, the so that's really the question, right? How, how much of a structure really is there and how much do they get? Maybe, they're, maybe it's like the Far Side cartoon. When we learn to talk to dolphins, all they're going to be saying is mackerel, mackerel, <laughs> mackerel, mackerel. Um, don't know. We'll see. Yeah. So uh, you talked about finding these hidden patterns. And, uh, is there one specific method that you use across all of these, or all of them custom methods for each problem? No, no, it's the same method across all. That's the whole point of it. Um, that making a customized method for each, or even tuning it, yeah. is really cheating. Right. So, so, so what is the general method? That you uh, have? Look up this guy's PhD thesis, <laughs> David Menon. Yeah. Um, okay. The explanation of it takes me a long time to figure out myself, and then takes about an hour to explain. Um, the, big, the big thing here is you can, do, you can do some naive things that are really hardcore NP complete. Um, David has an algorithm that works in polynomial time. And that's the big contribution, that you can actually run this thing and get on big data sets and actually get something before the heat death of the universe. Um, so if you're interested in pattern recognition, I highly recommend it. It's really it's kind of the, the, one of the first real starts on this. Also, in California, you have Amon Kyo down at Riverside. He has some nice methods that are good components of this stuff. Um, and there's a few other people around the world right now who are specializing in this. But it's surprisingly open field. Um, I always lived in fear, fear that David's thesis was, you know, we're going to have somebody show up in his defense, and somebody says, oh, yeah, I did that in, you know, 92. Um, and we lived in fear with that for like a decade. And nobody ever came up and said that. Um, so it really seems like there's a lot of stuff to be done there. Because it's hard. I mean, pattern discovery is, pattern discovery with dynamic time warps to it for a time varying series, really hard stuff. But very useful. Any other questions? Yeah. I was watching on the screen here mm -hmm. uh, what you were seeing, I presume, out of yep. your left eye. Yep. And I noticed several times you were logging in. Yes. In the midst of a phrase, while you were talking. Yep. Can you describe that phenomenon of being able to type your password as you're speaking? It's called compiled macros. <laughs> compiled macros. Yeah. Uh, so you know the muscle memory thing? Yeah. If you type a password often so enough. You were using oh. your little keyboard. Yeah. Because you can get it out and on pretty quickly. Yeah. The, uh, I can show you uh, more of it. Come on. Things be a little slow here. Um, so this has 12 keys in the front. Um, I can type up to 130 words per minute on it. I sustain around 70. Um, I also got a little joystick on the back and a few other buttons for like control, shift, all that sort of thing. Um, uh, and the thing is that you can learn this thing. You can get desktop level speeds with three times less learning time than a normal desktop. It uses cording, so it's just, oh, I can do this. Ha! Huh. Put it in front of the camera. 
<laughs> camera screwed over your head. Where's the camera? It's up to the ceiling. He moved it. Just hold your hands still. He'll find you. Oh. oh yeah. Ah, there we go. And my keys have sort of worn off. Okay, so this is a really awkward. <laughs> this is a really awkward angle. So it's A B C D E F G H. So you can kind of see the F G and H. Oh, keep it keep it keep it tight if you could. Keep the uh, view tight. Okay. So then there's this red dot here which you can barely see. That's the red shift. You can probably see the over here I J and K. So hold this down I J K L M N O P Q. And there's a blue shift here R S T U V W X Y Z. So because it's sequential. Um, you can learn the alphabet in about five minutes. You'll be touch typing in about 20 minutes. In about uh, six hours, you're doing 30 words per minute, which is a top speed, 100 peck person on a normal desktop. Um, after about 20 hours, uh, you're, you're around 50, 60 words per minute. To give you some comparison, um, getting an A in a high school typing class, which is about 68 hours of practice, um, is 40 words per minute. So you can actually do significantly better on this than you can on a desktop as far as learning rate. Now, you still were speaking just then as you passed your password. Right. I, that I, was I, the phenomenon. I yeah, was really that's, in. and I sort of did on purpose. <laughs> uh, the, uh, when you have things that you have uh, done lots of times, for example, um, the, right, it's a macro, and that's three strokes. two. Actually, no, in this case, it's just one chord. Oh, OK. Right. So if I want to do something like this, because that happens to be one of the test phrases when you're learning to do the Twiddler. Um, you do these 500 phrases over and over again so I can type them off the top of my head. Um, I could do that and maintain conversation because it's just like the, uh, the mobile music touch. It's kind of muscle memory. And you can also uh, take notes on what you're saying. Um, sort of like that. <laughs> <laughs> that was not a very impressive uh, uh, display. <laughs> Ooh, and my key's sticking. Interesting. But um, if you try to do something like read email, uh, which it's is easier if you close your eyes. Yes, That's actually. You, you close your eyes and you get. If you, if you don't pay attention, yeah. you get slightly better speeds and slightly uh, lower errors. It's a standard phenomenon with motor control. Yeah. Have you tried taking the web idea and applying it to Twitter? Actually, there's a guy by the name of uh, Von Pratt here who's done that. He had a, co a paper at Iswick called uh, International Symposium Wearable Computers called Thumb Code. Um, and he got, I think, 25 words per minute off of it. Right, so you just map, you know, Q, uh, Q W, E, R, T. I was thinking specifically training the Twiddler with the vibrations. Oh, um, well, more, uh, this has this back and forth motion, so I'm not quite sure how you train that. But for course stenography, which doesn't, a lot of it doesn't, um, you might be able to do it. So one of the things that we really think might be useful is doing um, vibration for course stenography. Maybe also for sign language, maybe for complicated gestures. We don't know. This, this whole passive haptic learning thing is new. Um, we haven't found it in the literature anywhere. Um, if somebody knows of something, please tell me. Um, uh, so we're quite excited about it because you know, it's one of these things that you just, you just don't know what to do with it yet. Yeah. Have you considered taking the glove idea and apply it to learning to walk? Yeah. We, we've, there's other ways to do that. Um, they make exoskeletons now. They make wearable robotics where they have an exoskeleton that helps people learn to, uh, learn to walk again. Um, there's a Swiss company that does that. The Shiver Center has one. And it really does give you about two levels of improvement on the normal rehab scale. Um, so there's lots of people working on that right now. If you have other questions or you want to play with some of these toys, come on down. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.